Welcome to Value Through Vulnerability. This is a podcast dedicated to putting the human back into humanity. And today I am very excited to introduce you to a very awesome human called Steve Keith. He is founder and chief behavioral officer of his own company called The Branding Man. And welcome to the podcast, Steve. Hi, Gary. How are you? I am doing very well. This lovely, I think it's a Monday. Um, how are you doing? How's things for you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm also shocked that it's a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> This weekend's going too quick. Yeah. As we get going, would you mind giving our listeners a little bit more of a background? So who is Steve? You know, how did the branding man come into being? And what are you passionate about? Yeah, um, of course. So um, the branding man, I launched that last year, um, September time. And that was following a eight year career working at Ernst & Young, now EY, um, on their um, apprenticeship programs. And I was leading on the marketing and communications of that. And before that, I was a secondary school teacher um, here in London, uh, teaching geography. And I think that's, that's what, what links everything is young people. So whether it was teaching them in the classroom, helping them to develop employability skills in voluntary roles that I've done, or actually helping them to find that right career for them that's setting them up for life or helping them to reach their potential or even just putting that first step on the ladder. Um, it's what, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, I mean, I, I won't lie, there were points when I was a teacher towards the end that it was the reason that I didn't want to get out of bed. Um, but um, that, that's, that's what makes me jump out and go, right, okay, let's do something today. That's awesome. And you, you sort of you've answered one of my questions already, because we, we often have jokes in the UK, don't we, about people doing geography degrees, and it's not normally to become a geography teacher. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of like, I didn't, I'm not saying I fell into being a geography teacher, but I think I probably did. It's one of those things people said, oh, I think you'd make a good, make a good teacher. I hadn't necessarily um, thought about what I was going to do as a career when I was at university. Um, and that's a lot of the messaging that I push through the branding man to be fair as well I call it my witch career no idea syndrome um, and then that connecting the dots piece when I look back now as I said is that young piece and uh, young person uh, passion for helping them um, not become Steve that took 20 years to find his dream job oh, that's that's really powerful and did you always want to be a teacher then or you, you mentioned you sort of fell into it um... I mean, I've, I've always had the passion for um, standing up in front of people and sharing a message and helping people to grow. So teaching does that perfectly. What teaching doesn't enable you to do a lot of the time is it's the admin side of it and all of the red tape and tracking. And I know you have to be able to show that the, the, what you've taught in a lesson has had an outcome or had an impact. But a lot of the time it can be quite stifling because it doesn't help people to actually um, explore themselves um, and figure out who they are. I think that that's a big problem with young people at the moment is that they just get really, um, I mean, you look at it, there's uh, the teenage suicides have, are at the highest they've ever been at, mental health problems are at the height of they've, what they've ever been. And um, our young people are struggling. Um, and it's because they, in my opinion, a lot of it is because they can't necessarily make the link in their head between what they're learning and where it's going to take them. It's really, really rich feedback that because there's, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around, of course, you know, you look at the real world of work and it's so volatile, you know, we need to be flexible, we need to be, you know, utilising those most innate human skills that we all have, those gifts. Do you think that's part of the challenge for the young people that you see is that actually... There is just such a disconnect between what they maybe see on social media as what the world of work needs versus what they're learning. Absolutely. I mean, with, with social media, I mean, we could probably have a whole like conversation about that for about three hours, to be honest, because I think with, with social media, my opinion and my stance on it is that we've kind of we've got it wrong in positioning all of these people or allowing them to position themselves as well as influencers when by, by my opinion, they don't necessarily have influence. I think influence is something that you earn um, and can take a lot of time. It, it involves building trust with people. It involves being able to master a particular skill. It involves a lot of knowledge and being able to work out how you share that and make sure it translates to somebody um, in the way that they think. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily the way that influence comes across for for young people when they look at social media because they just see somebody that's a, a social media star and follow them 
um, which is which is fine, but it's it's not for me what the word influence means. I prefer to use the word role model um, because I think it sets the bar a lot higher in terms of expectations and accountability of the people and the person that's actually pushing a message out or sharing. I'd love to come back to that. I think that you know influence, trust, role modeling. I think there's some great some great stuff to discuss there, Steve. We'll we'll come back to that for sure. In terms of the branding man that you set up, you know, quite recently, I really love your tagline and that you speak about inclusion comes first. Mm. Do you mind speaking to that? Because, you know, I'm sort of quite new into the DNI space, if you use it as a holistic term. But I have heard more and more the last 12 months that we're focusing potentially in the wrong part of that equation too often. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. I suppose the way I look at it is that it's... Um, a lot of um, employers that I work with or that I'm aware of in the student recruitment sector um, where I focus, but to be fair across the whole recruitment spectrum, is that diversity and inclusion is at the top of most businesses' agendas at the moment, and quite rightly so. But um, we've got it the wrong way around. Um, it should be inclusion and diversity, because I think you need to think about how they connect um, and there's starting to be a lot of um, research findings or opinion pieces that are coming out suggesting that diversity initiatives that are being set up um, that identify particular minority groups and help to lift them up or support them or raise their profile uh, or tackle the particular stigmas or issues that they're facing um, are failing. Um, and it's my belief that they're failing because they're underpinned by inclusion and the inclusion conversation isn't being um, had. So therefore these initiatives are falling down because they've got no foundation that they're based on. Um, if you look at inclusion and from my perspective of working with employers and young people and trying to bridge the two, is that young people have got um, a huge task and it goes back to the, the kind of the second half of that question that you just asked around social media and the world of work, that there's a huge transition. It's very different working in an environment and I can say this from being a teacher as well in an environment where there's a bell that tells you where you've got to be when you've got to be there and a timetable that tells you what you're going to learn when you're sat in a seat now you can argue that in a work environment you get that because I know for a fact that my, my own calendar now for the branding man but my one at EY as well used to be just completely jam-packed um, and we always have this um, kind of thing of or I'm in back-to-back -back meetings in a corporate environment, say, for example. Um, but that transition from the classroom into the boardroom, which is a terminology that a lot of people use in my market, is um, it's quite a big one. And unless you're actually understanding the challenges that a young person is having, and actually then building programs, support mechanisms, um, and opportunities that speak to those, um, whether or not you then identify that they're a woman, they're a, a, a black lady, um, somebody that's disabled, somebody that's LGBT, somebody that's suffering from um, a mental um, health issue, um, you're not going to be able to get it right because there's a mismatch. Um, so my approach in terms of inclusive branding is to go from the inside out. So learn as much as you can about the people that you've got and try and attract more of those people, um, rather than working towards, and from a diversity point of view, I feel that like diversity is very much, not, not, sometimes it can be seen as a box ticking exercise, but when you start putting quotas on things, it's a very dangerous territory. Um, and let's face it, like some of the, the best businesses in the world are built around the people that they hire. So if you've got that right, get more of those people and your business will grow. Don't, don't try too hard. And I think that's where the D part of diversity and inclusion um, fails. It tries too hard. Because um, inclusion, it is a difficult concept, but it's, a, it's naturally a very easy conversation to have once people start opening up. People love to talk about themselves. Give them that opportunity, is what I always say. It's, it's really, what's coming up for me, there's a lot of things coming up, but there's something coming up for me around the link between inclusion, Steve, and belonging. Mm. And I'm yeah. just wondering what that might be for you in terms of how you, because in my interpretation, it would be a lot easier to include from a place or an environment that allows everyone to show up who they are. Mm. Yeah, 
yeah, you're completely you're completely right. But the the so if I speak to my own lived experiences, um, which is a big part of inclusion for me. Um, so I'm a gay man. Um, I didn't come out until um, I was 24. So that's 24 years of my life where I've hid something. I've not been able to be my full, most authentic self. Um, for whatever reason that that might have been. And a lot of it is, is kind of grounded in um, stigmas, opinions. Um, people love to throw opinions around, um, particularly around sexuality, because they don't necessarily understand it. And of all of the different diversity characteristics as well, um, the LGBT plus community is probably one of the hardest ones to engage with because it's something that's in, it's very emotional. It's based on feelings. Um, it's not based on your genetic makeup of who you are. Um, and so it was, it was very difficult when I was, it was a very difficult process for anybody to come out. But there's, there is a part when you identify as being part of the LGBT community that you almost have to come out in every single conversation that you have throughout your life. So even though the people that I want to know um, that I identify as being gay, um, no now, which makes me a lot happier because I can be myself around them. Mm -hmm. um, there's every conversation that I have, and this was the difference between teaching and being in a corporate environment for me. I came through the, um, the Teach First program, which was um, a fast track teacher training program that puts the graduates into some of the most challenging schools in the UK. You start that process by doing a six week intensive teacher training course and then you get thrown straight into the classroom as a full time classroom teacher. For me, at the age of 23, that was enough to be dealing with without thinking about how I am my most authentic self as a gay man in front of a group of vulnerable young people because that's what they that's what they're termed as being um and you only have to look at everything that's happened over the last 12 months in the news um, around um back back where i come from up in the northwest but in the midlands as well but parents protesting outside schools about um, their children being taught how to be gay um to understand why there are probably so many teachers that don't bring their whole self to work the difference when I moved into EY was that I very quickly felt that I was accepted for who I was and that my opinions mattered and that I could um, share my voice and almost in a way, I mean, a lot of people kind of, it was interesting, I should take a sidestep whilst it's popping into my head. Um, I was at a friend's wedding two months ago, for example, and her cousin, who I haven't um, ever met before, introduced himself. Um, I'm rather embarrassingly now, I can't remember his actual name. But what he said was, let's just call him Scott. So he said, hi, I'm Scott, I'm pansexual. And I thought, what a bizarre way of introducing yourself. It's not like I walk up to everybody and go, hi, I'm Steve, I'm gay. Um, but, and that was, that was kind of the difference when I was in my corporate career. And even now, I don't really ever feel like I have to divulge that information. And I suppose that's the challenge you've got as well when you're looking at inclusion and, and diversity side of things and that belonging piece is that when you identify as having um, or coming from what we call in recruitment an undisclosed characteristic of diversity, the challenge is a little bit different because you then have to um, gauge every situation and, and almost have like a spectrum of like, how far do I be myself in that situation? Um, because you, there, there is sadly still in the, in the LGBT community, for example, a lot of people who will um, just see the rainbow and think about unicorns and pink things and think that it's all about being flamboyant and camp and, I mean, I, had, I have my moments of being flamboyant in camp. I was out last night for a friend's birthday. Um, at, there's a, a club here in London called Horse Meat Disco, and I was living my best disco life. Um, and I'd just come back from the OTC and share. So if you're going to kind of look at a stereotypical gay man, that was probably me last night. Um, but there are much, uh, there's much more richness to the community there, and you need to take that time to understand it, to be able to to um, appreciate it. But 
I've, I never felt at any point in my, going back to that piece around DUI and what, me feeling that I belonged somewhere. Um, it, there was, maybe it was the team that I was working in. It was certainly the leadership within the organization as well that helped with that. Um, they had a fantastic allies program, for example. So for any of your listeners that don't particularly know what that might mean, it means um, somebody who doesn't identify with that community, um, supporting and helping to push the agenda forward. So a great example of an ally of mine is um, Harriet, who I went to see share with last night. Now, she doesn't have to advocate for the LGBTQ community, but she does because she knows that it's right and she's got a friend who um, f- uh, identifies with that and wants to support them. Um, and that's also a trick that I think we miss when it comes to the bigger inclusion piece is that a lot of organizations do have um, networks that are focused on DNI and they're phrased as, they're phrased, sorry, they're, um, they're positioned as being DNI networks or diversity networks. That's wrong for a start. They're inclusion networks, they're belonging networks. Um, and I mean, I've taken a step, I'm working on something at the moment that I'm hoping to launch in the next um, month or so, which speaks to the inclusion piece, but also my own experiences, um, as a new business owner now around, I mean, I'm speaking to you now, I'm working from home. I spend a lot of time working by myself now, and I've previously spent a, a time working in teams. Um, and so one of the challenges that I face Um, which compounds with the experiences that I often have as being as identifying as LGBT is kind of that loneliness and being outside and being an other. Um, And so when you've got things like ally programs, they just help to just um, start conversations and spread messages and educate people um, and take away stigmas. Um, so we have to be really careful, I think, about how we create these networks. And it's all fine and well saying, oh, we've got a women's network and men are allowed to come along. There are a very small number of men that will actually go along, let's be honest. Um, but there, you don't have to necessarily go along to the meeting or anything like that. You can just, there's small things you can do. In a meeting, if you notice that there's um, a dominant male voice in a meeting, encourage the females in the group to share their opinion. Don't just sit and wait and think because somebody is quiet. And this is a piece of feedback that I had in my first couple of years at EY was that I'm, I'm, um, I'm very introverted. So it takes me a lot of confidence at times in a new group of people, especially to speak up. It's kind of ironic because once I get talking, as you'll find in, um, I can't really shut up. Um, but it's because I internalize my thoughts. And then what, what the feedback I had was you're very quiet during meetings, but then you're usually the person at the end that summarizes everything and comes up with the big idea or the, the common theme that's gone through everything. And that, that adds value to a meeting situation. But what I wasn't very good at was kind of being present throughout the meeting because I was spending so much time in my head. People were interpreting that as me not being bothered. Mm-hmm. Um, And you can simply just bring people into a conversation by kind of asking for their opinion. And often as well, people just don't kind of take that. There's an extra step there. If you're on a a meeting, as I, we used to be, where you've got colleagues that are in other offices that aren't in the room, it's very easy to forget that somebody's on a conference call. Um, So make a point of asking on the call, has anybody got anything that they'd like to share? Because when you're not in the room, even if you're an extroverted person, it's, you're still going to have to try and gauge when the gap in the conversation is because you haven't got the visual cues to enable you to work out when you can speak. Um, so it's, this is why, it's why the inclusion bits are important because it's, 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 the, it's what makes teams work well, essentially. Um, so no matter whether, or if you, even if you've got every single diversity group represented in a meeting room with you. That doesn't mean that the team is going to work well. The team is going to work well when everybody feels like they can contribute and that they're not going to be judged and that their opinion is valued. I I, I just love everything you've just shared, Steve. And I think the thing that's coming up for me really powerfully is the importance of safety. Yes. So, you know, the ability for you, me as a straight male, you as a, a gay male, someone else who's black or whatever your background is, to truly see and create the space for people to truly actually speak up through mm-hmm. their, as Nilipa Merchant would say, 
she wrote a book called Oliness. Mm -hmm. She speaks about that every single one of us on this planet have got a unique spot in the world that only we can see. Mm -hmm. And it's actually leaning, I don't want to use leaning in, but you know, it's actually being curious for me about like our conversation now is fascinating for me because you know, I'm learning through your lived experience and you can learn through mine, mm. but it takes time and intentionality to actually do that. And I'm not sure how many people want to prioritize that time for that agenda. So I'm really intrigued in what your thoughts might be around that. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I'm just trying to lean over here and see it because I've got it in my bookshelf. But um, there's a book that I haven't got around to reading yet because my bookshelf, as I look at it there, is just rammed full of books. I'm one of these people that goes, oh, that should be a good book. And then I buy it and then I don't find time to read it. But Malcolm Gladwell's just um, published a new book called Talking to Strangers. And I think um, when, you, when you do take that time to um, make the effort to speak to somebody who doesn't have the same lived experience as you, is, is fundamentally in many ways very different to you. First of all, that's a really rich experience for you personally. It's quite humbling sometimes to hear other people's stories and understand the challenges that they've been going through. We don't take enough time to do that now. We're too busy scrolling, swiping and living in our, in our inboxes to almost, in a way, care what the person sat next to us that we haven't spoken to all day because we've been so preoccupied with what's on the screen in front of us is actually experiencing. Um, and that, um, that opportunity to understand the other is a really important part of belonging and safety in the workplace because it's, um, it opens up a lot of doors, but it also, um, helps to educate people and, and stop them from almost in a way tripping up um, and unintentionally saying things. I have a, a, a colleague that um, I'm from a previous role that's uh, transgender. And she, some of the stories that she's told me about the things that people have said to her and not realized what they've said um, are quite shocking. And that's from in, within my own community. So it doesn't necessarily have to mean that if you're gay and you want to experience the other, you should go and speak to somebody who has a disability or, or look across all of the different diversity groups and think, oh, who am I going to pick to have a meeting with? I've done that before. I'll be completely honest. When I was in my very early days at EY, I was trying to be very strategical to climb my way up the ladder. So I was thinking, who should I go and speak to to start to understand how I'm gonna make it here. And I was quite tactical. I went for a lot of the diversity things. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna go and speak to that person because. Mm -hmm. And there was an agenda before I went. It wasn't because I'm just gonna go and speak to that person and build my network. Um, and when you don't have a focus on it, or you don't have even anybody that's particularly like leading on it. So um, on, on my pod, like last week, I interviewed one of my old EY colleagues, Joanne, and she's, um, the UK's diversity, inclusion and belonging strategy lead at the firm. Now to have somebody that focuses on that full time as their job is massively important, especially when it's somebody like Joanne as well, because she's just finished studying a master's in belonging, looking at psychological safety um, in minority groups. So not only is she, um, she's got she's got a priority in terms of her role for the organization she's got a personal interest in it um and i think when you also as well, people that i mean you're always going to have people that will advocate for their situation and people that won't i was having an interesting conversation with somebody a few weeks ago about some of the challenges that i find when i go into businesses and and try and sell them my services around storytelling it's a very difficult concept for people to grasp which is quite um, laughable at points I think because if there's one thing that our brains are hardwired for it's storytelling we've been telling them around campfires when we used to be hunting for food we've told them through things like the bible we've told them through hieroglyphs in Egypt we've told them through countless Disney films and things um, it's a very easy way to to tap into a conversation and, and start to understand somebody and we miss so many opportunities when we don't stop and just listen as well. What a powerful comment. I love your point about, about listening. Um, just before we carry on our conversation, your, your friend Joe sounds incredibly interesting. So, um, wow, a, a, a master's in belonging. That is a fascinating topic area. Mm. And it came, it's, it's a passion that came as well for us. And, um, 
that she decided she was interested in it. And this is, again, it's, it's a good reason um, when you've got an organisation that is truly bought into an agenda like inclusion and belonging alongside diversity, um, that they will invest in their people and start to build experts. And that speaks to this whole piece with the inclusion as well, I think, particularly in corporate environments. We're starting to see a flattening of structure within organ big organisations. Hierarchical org structures are uh, not what my target market, Generation Z, expect to see or want to see in the workplace, for example. Um, and quite rightly so. I think kind of there is this piece of kind of, I always make a joke, there's a, a wonderful graphic, which is a load of birds sitting on a, a telegraph pole and the one at the top is pooping down on all the other ones. And that's what delegation in big organisations largely is. I mean, it's, it's largely what delegation is full stop. Like it's you basically saying, I don't want to do that, deal with it. Um, and when you flatten out a structure and start to build out experts, it's one of the reasons that my career was accelerated as much as it was. And Joanne and I first met on a rapid development program at EY, which, which was investing annually in 12 people within the talent function that they'd identified as being experts in particular fields that they wanted to invest in and to grow. And so I'll always be thankful for that because it's given me a platform and it's helped me to then move out of my comfort zone and into a new territory and stretch myself. And I really enjoy stretching myself, but also as well in terms of um, working within organizations, speaking back to the inclusion piece, if somebody doesn't feel like they belong or they fit in with an organization, they're not gonna put in the effort. And if you don't put in the effort, you're not gonna go the extra mile. And if you're not going the extra mile, you're not stretching yourself. So it's, it's, again, it's, inclusion is so exciting for me because it, it just speaks to so many things that um, people are looking for um, and tackles that vulnerability piece head on because it says, um, you have an experience that is different to mine. I want to understand it. You've got me writing down a formula here. I do yeah. like a formula, Steve. Okay. But what you just spoke to, which I think is really powerful, was like inclusion plus belonging equals diversity. Yeah. So actually, you get those two front end pieces working, then people will be their true self. They can be more vulnerable. They can show a little bit more of that true self because they feel safe to do it. And then you will create the diverse culture off the back of that. That's what I'm sensing. That's yeah. really powerful. Yeah. I mean, it's a, there's probably like, there's probably some people maybe listening to this that might think that, um, that stand by the, the DNI and the D being first, but there is, in terms of recruitment and everything, I'll go back to that piece about the inside out. Um, you, just, you just need to take the time to, to really invest in, in your people to make sure that they, they're getting the best out of themselves. And there is, it's just, I don't know, yeah yeah you know i get so passionate about this sometimes that i just have moments where i just like end up staring and scratching my chin as you probably just said staring out the window so i'll try and stop myself from doing that it's a good look steve don't worry it's a good look <laughs> i think i think what's what's really important and i'm gonna i've got a little bit of a segue now but it is relevant steve yeah. i find it really interesting that you're really focusing your work at the branding man around this inside out model Mm. You're trying to get people to see inside of their organization, and I would even say inside of themselves, in order that they actually project the right message or the most authentic message of mm. what they want to project. Is that a fair understanding? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, the authenticity piece, it, it fits in with vulnerability, it fits in with courage, connection. <laughs> There's a great, um, I mean, I'm a big fan of the work of Brené Brown. So. I'm listening on an audio book at the moment, which is out of character for me because I do love the touch and feel of paper when you're reading a book, but um, the power of vulnerability I'm on with her at the moment. And she speaks a lot about what vulnerability is, but the, the, the session that I listened to this morning actually was around that authenticity piece. Um, and the, the, when it comes to inclusion and you, you, when you're trying to attract um, minority groups and going from it for a diversity point of view. Um, 
there's a lot from an employer brand perspective at the moment, say, for example, that there's a, um, an authenticity gap developing. So what companies say you're going to get out of working for them is increasingly um, not what people are experiencing when they actually start the job. Um, so we're being hoodwinked. Um, it's almost like the, the model that's there for consumer marketing and mass marketing of buy this product, buy this product, buy this product, buy it now, um, which is essentially a lot of the time can become the case with recruitment because when your pipeline isn't filling, you have to do more. So you just turn the volume up to try and attract more attention. Um, but it, it, it creates a gap when you get in there and that will then create all sorts of problems. But if you actually do it the opposite way around, which is the approach that, of that inside out piece with, that I've got with the branding man, what you're actually doing is being very intelligent because you're, um, you're looking at all of the different touch points that you've got with a, with a candidate from the moment that we might have met as um, a school student, um, studying their A-levels, for example, at a sixth form college, right through to the moment that they become partner within your organisation. It's a massive piece of work, but unless you've got a consistent message, a, cons a consistent um, approach towards inclusion and belonging throughout that process, people like start to get disenchanted, they'll disengage from something. Um, and that, um, that piece that you were speaking to there around people um, self-advocating and sharing their story um, is an important part of that inclusion because it's almost an indication that somebody's got to that point where they feel that they do belong because they're owning their voice and they're sharing um, little bits about their self. And you have to be, you, as you kind of, as I find, I found through my, my professional career for the last 13 years so far, that it, it does just so much wonders for your personal confidence, for building your, your professional network as well. Because say for me at the moment, and you've got the same, you work in sales, so people buy from people. So you have to be able to give a little bit of yourself to people in order for them to trust you and then to go on that journey with you. So whether or not that's investing in inclusion and helping people to, to feel like they fit in within the workplace, or whether that's setting an aspirational tone with a young person, that that's the place where I'm going to, for want of a better expression, because I don't particularly like it, but find yourself. Um, you're, you're missing a trick. Um, and as I've said before, that, that transition when you're going from classroom into boardroom is just so um, important. Um, but that isn't to belittle kind of the experience of once you get in because um, it's, a, it's a long road. And also as well, when you're in your career, um, there's a, I'm looking at the bookcase again, there's a great book by Jenny Blake called Pivot. She used to work at Google. Um, and it's that confidence as well to know that actually, um, when I left EY last year, for example, it wasn't necessarily because I was having an awful time. Um, there was an element of burnout. I was working too hard. I was being asked to do too much. I wasn't saying no um, back. Um, I was just accepting that that was part of what was expected of getting to the next level. Um, but a lot of my friends at the moment that work in corporate careers, um, my best friend, for example, that I was talking to last night whilst we were in between uh, dancing on the disco floor, um, kind of once you get to a certain point, I think there's a lot of people that have become quite confident and go, do you know what, like, I don't really want to have that promotion conversation because I know that it's actually going to do me some harm. Um, and again, speaking to that hierarchical structure, when you flatten a structure, the, the expectations of working longer and harder to get to the top are blown away. So people are able to think, right, what do I want out of my life? Um, and what can I focus on? Um, that makes me happy and that was what my transition from um, being full-time employed to being self-employed was all about it was about me going right I feel confident that I've achieved everything I wanted to achieve here let's do something different because the days when you work in the same job um, like both of my parents have um, and this isn't kind of saying that it's it's necessarily a bad thing they both had great careers but they were in the same job for 25, 30 years. They were happy, um, but I couldn't think of anything worse. 
personally. Um, life's, a, life's a journey. You've got to experience all of it, the good parts and the bad parts. And there have been some really, really kind of bad and dark moments that I've had. Um, and you, they, they, they make you a stronger person when you actually stand up to them and acknowledge them rather than just sweeping them away under the carpet and thinking that they're going to go away. This, what you're speaking to, which is like such a beautiful summary for me, Steve, is around that owning, this, owning your own narrative. Exactly. That's, exactly. I think that that's totally not what I did as well when I burnt myself out four years ago. And I'm hearing you talk about it. And it's really interesting, actually, that you're approaching your business from this inside out model, where actually what you've also done, and I've done it in my own way, is understand, it, is understand that actually we need to, our human experience is also inside out. It's, how, it's what we think about ourselves and we project it. Yeah. So I thought that me challenging bullying in the workplace a number of years ago and me getting told to go away was why I burnt myself out. But mm. it wasn't. It's that I told myself on hearing that, that I wasn't good enough or that I'm going to be bullied again like I was when I was 13. Yeah. Like realizing that everything is inside out is really, really powerful. Mm. And I just really see a parallel between the work you do and actually how we live a human experience. So I'm sorry I'm getting a little bit spiritual there, but I've got, that's something I'm sensing. You're absolutely right. I mean, it, it does speak to that. Like I've, I've read a lot of, I'm looking at the bookcase again, <laughs> I've read a lot of, like there's a really great book in terms of anybody that's looking at starting a business called The Good Hustle by um, Dr. Polly McGee. Um, and that it speaks to that piece around, and we've chatted about this as well, around working out what, who you're serving rather than um, being self-serving um, and that that inside out but it just it speaks to that as well and for me as well being tactical from a business perspective it takes people on a journey so I have three stages of engagement with my clients knowing who your audience is knowing how to communicate with them so that they then feel comfortable either joining and then once they join advocating um, and when somebody's got that, that kind of self-awareness about themselves and feels like they're, they're included and they fit, it becomes easier for them to tell their story. Um, and I've had conversations over the last year where people have said, oh, I'd, I'd love to be able to do this. I just don't feel comfortable telling my story. And it's, it's the easiest thing that you can do. And I know it's, I know it's hard, but it, for me, it is very easy to do because nobody else has done it. Nobody else will ever walk the path that you've walked. You know everything that you've experienced on that um, journey. It's about confidence and feeling like you can share without being shamed, to kind of paraphrase Brené's work. Um, which, which really speaks to a lot of how I approach my business, but how I approach myself. I mean, I get things wrong. I make mistakes. I'm a human being. Um, but I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that as I'm on this journey of my own as well, I'm getting better at acknowledging when I'm making those mistakes, <laughs> holding my hands up and going, yes, that behavior was not a behavior that is aligned with my values apologizing learning from it and moving on for example um and there's a, there is a when you, again from a inclusion and an authenticity point of view we're very nervous as um human beings but also as organizations that are trying to attract talent at saying what we're doing wrong because we feel like we're going to be judged for it um and actually um, one of the most powerful things as part of my training when I was on the Teach First program, actually 10 years, 10 plus years ago, was that we were invited to go along to these things called cock-up clubs. And it was where leaders from the partners of partnerships that were working with the charity spent time with us and told us about the biggest mistakes that they've made in their careers and what they learned from it. And that's the important piece as well. And from an employer brand perspective, when I'm working with clients and they go, oh, we'd never want to say what we're doing wrong. It's like, well, no, it's not about saying what you're doing wrong. You can, you can flip it around and say, we've acknowledged that we need to be better at, and so we're investing in. For me as a candidate looking at an organization that I want to go and work for, that would it be, it would make it more attractive for a start, because I would feel like they had a good self-awareness of where they were on their own 
um, journey towards being um, a better business. But also as well, I'd see that as an opportunity. I'd be looking at things and going, oh, do you know, that's something that's really interesting. I'd love to start carving my, my career out in that particular area. So that's the organization that I'm going to apply to. But there's a level of smartness, there's a level of time investment, there's a level of budget as well in those kind of projects. Um, and when you take, um, when you take people on that journey from inside out, it is not going to be a quick fix. Which goes back to that point I was making earlier about diversity. When you set up um, a network or an event for a particular diversity group, um, which can be done in the space of an hour if you want to, you can add a page to a website, you can create an event and put it on Eventbrite and start selling tickets and say that you've done diversity. Um, the work of inclusion is never going to be done because we're all, we've all got such different lived experiences that that's the opportunity, but it's also the barrier. It's <clears throat> cock up clubs, first of all, love it. And yeah. I think um, what, what's really powerful is thinking about the, the environment that you serve with young people, Steve, is that um, I don't know if you've heard of WD40 and Gary Ridge, their CEO. So he's, his, his Twitter handle is actually Learning Moment. Okay. And he heads up a what, 300 million turnover business for the WD40, the little lubricants can. And they literally don't have mistakes. They do literally call them learning moments. So you could imagine coming through the education system and Steve Keith working with a WD40 on that onboarding and but knowing that the ceo speaks yep. the language of learning moments like that's just a completely different world to anything i experienced 20 plus years ago yeah no you're, you're completely right and if i think like what's popping into my head at the moment is um one of my uh pupils from when i was a teacher jamala um i recently reconnected with her and she has transformed in that very way she's she's learned from everything that she experienced as a, a young person and matured into this great um, young woman who is slaying it for want of a better word. Um, because she's owning that narrative and she's, she's highlighting the fact that when she was at school, she was um, not the best of students, that she had a lot of challenges going on in her, her family life in the background that me as a teacher had no awareness of. I was just interpreting the fact that she wouldn't do any of the work that I'd set her because she was being um, obstructive. Um, and I mean, again, when you're a teacher, I, I had, as a geography teacher, I had over 300 pupils a week come through my classroom. You don't have the time to get to know 300 people um, when you've only got an hour or two hours with them a week. Um, but when, when you've got that ability, and it is a skill to be able to reflect, um, we don't make enough time for self-reflection. I think we're too busy looking forwards to spend the time looking back because we feel like looking back is a, um, a waste of time. Um, but I know on my own experience from the last 12 months, I've, I've started journaling and I find it really useful, even if I don't do it every day, um, to spend time sitting with a cup of coffee and just thinking about what's in my head. Um, it helps me become a better business owner because it focuses me on the tasks that are important to my business, but also to me. Um, but it helps me to offload as well and get things out of my head. Because I do have a, a, a habit of ruminating on things and spiraling. Um, and I have a separate book that I call my catastrophe journal. Um, that if I know that I'm going to start spiraling, I just write out what the scenario is going to be and how I'm going to end up dead in prison or something like that, which is where my mind will go. Um, and then every two weeks or so, I just read through it and just have a laugh at myself and add some humour to the situation. That's, that's such a great, such a great bit of advice. I, I love that. <laughs> that's a, and you know what's really powerful for me? And you know, you're speaking to so many elements of this podcast on this lovely conversation, Steve, around trust around vulnerability, around courage, around role modeling, around inclusion. And I think my summary message we look to wrap up now is like back yourself. If you're listening to Steve and I have a conversation now and you are doubting yourself or you're judging yourself or you're feeling ashamed, like what is that unique spot in the world that only you can see? Like, yeah. And why don't you write it down, maybe journal Steve about what that looks like for them. You know, what, what other advice might you give someone that's listening to us right now, whether it's a young person or whether it's just, 
you know, any human being that's heard our conversation, what, what, what would you like them to take away from the conversation? I think it speaks to what you just said there, Gary, to be honest. I think it would just be like, have the confidence to own it. Um, it's scary. It's going to be hard. Um, but ultimately, and I'm speaking just from my, my own, um, especially over the last 12 months, but my own experiences, it's worth the investment in doing it and, and back yourself. Um, because you are, everybody's, there's so many quotes that are flying out there about it, but everybody is a unique individual. We don't need to homogenize ourselves and then be like everybody else. It goes back to that piece around influencers and everybody kind of going in one direction. You can be part of a tribe, which is, which is some kind of really great um, language that's starting to come out of the world of inclusion at the moment as well, um, without becoming a sheep in a flock. Um, because you can still, it's the, it, it is a hard journey, but yeah, it's a, it's own it and, and be yourself. Yeah. Well, no better way to wrap up this conversation, Steve. I love it. Back yourself and be yourself. I love yeah. it. And it's funny, isn't it? When you think about it, that be are the first two words of belonging. Not thought about that till now. Well, there's a wonderful piece of branding or artwork creative there. That's just popping into my head. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> Hashtag no charge, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag no chart i've got i've got loads in my head as well so yeah there we are we can work on that one together now you can have that one for free steve all yours so how can people i see you've got your own podcast as well called my career journey so maybe just as you wrap up maybe give us a, a 30 second lowdown on your podcast and how people can reach you steve yeah 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 so you can um i have a website thebrandingman.co.uk um i'm all over social because part of my journey i suppose with uh inclusion and everything is that i'm a massive oversharer so um, they're all um, synergized to at the branding man. And then um, I launched a podcast back in the summer called My Career Story. And it's basically me talking to people about their own um, career stories. Um, because I think there's an important part there in terms of inclusion as well, about people not stressing about what's going on with their career and realizing that we're all in the same boat. And there's probably people that have had exactly the same thoughts and worries and concerns and they're still managing to make it through. So um, that was the reason I launched that. So there's some fantastic guests on there, including Joanne, who I've mentioned a couple of times, and also um, Polly, um, the author of The Good Hustle as well. So, yeah. Well, so well, look, keep up the great work. Thank you, Gary. No, you've been awesome. Really great. You've given loads of rich. You certainly have been an oversharer, and I'm sure people will be grateful. And uh, let's keep in touch, Steve. We look forward to, uh, to getting some feedback on this conversation. Great. Thanks, Gary. Take care. Bye.